Okay, my wonderful students, very happy to see you. And uh, let's get down to business. We're going to be talking today uh, about uh, momentum as the, the currency of interaction in physical systems. You know, what we do when we're, when we're interacting, uh, Kisla, in an economic sense, we exchange dineros, you know, exchange moolah. In physical systems, the way that they interact, one of the ways is momentum, and that's what we're gonna be talking. But before we do that, I've got a couple things. Uh, to go over with you. First of all, I believe this is accurate. Fridays, 11 a.m. to noon. Miss Darian has office hours. So if you are um, in the sound of my voice and you feel like, you know, Dr. B, I need extra help, like tutoring, uh, ding, right over there. Miss Darian. Every, and you know what? She has been all by herself up there the last few weeks. And that's a shame. So if you can make it, go visit Darian and kind of strategize your study techniques, your lecture notes, homework exercises, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And speaking of homework, hold on, I get it. Um, before we get to the momentum concepts, I want to review homework five, the bicycle wheel, a problem I know a bunch of you express some difficulty with it. Let's go over it and reinforce it. And hopefully, compared to what you've been doing, this will be a slightly different angle on it. And you can, you know, between what you've been thinking and between what I'm going to present here, hopefully you can kind of triangulate in and get a, get a good grasp on this bicycle wheel problem. The whole thing that we're going to work on, it, it, the, the reason that you had that set of bicycle wheel exercises was to think geometrically about velocity vectors and delta V vectors. All right, now... Um, the first one that I, I gave you a couple things to, to warm up with, and then I asked you to calculate the base angle of the isosceles triangle formed by the two velocity vectors, tail to tail. Um, and that is the delta V vector from the tip of V0 to the tip of V1. Uh, after the wheels turned six degrees. So that was the first one. Okay, so the velocities, after the wheel turns six degrees, the velocities are, are when you put them tail to tail, like this diagram, they're six degrees apart. Okay, and that's an accurate six degree representation. So if that's the case, then the delta V vector um, and watch the animation here. Here it comes from the left. Here it is. Right. That little guy there, that's the base of the isosceles triangle. And the isosceles triangle is tipped on its side for this diagram. All right. And let me move it out here. All right. So that's my delta V. Let me bring it back in. All right. So that's, that's the delta V. And every one of this sequence of, uh, let's see, five different uh, bicycle wheel problems you had to get an idea of that delta V vector. So let me park it out here a little bit and go ahead and add to your notes. Uh, that's the delta V vector. It's the base of the isosceles triangle if you put the two velocity vectors tail to tail. So the delta V, when the velocity vectors are tail to tail, delta V is tip to tip from earlier to later, all right? 
Uh, and this one happens to be tilted by 87 degrees. And the reason for that is that all three of the angles in the triangle have to add up to um, 180. Right? So if you know that the sharp acute angle between the two velocity vectors is 6 degrees, that means you have leftovers 174. All right? And so um, here's your calculation. Now you might want to jot this down. It's it's kind of a mixture of arithmetic and algebra. I don't have a symbol for base angle. I just wrote out the word. But the, the three angles in this isosceles triangle are the slivery top angle, six degrees in this case. And then two base angles that are the same size. So whatever the size is, multiply that by two and then add six to it, and that's got to come up with 180. Right now, get your clickers ready because we're going to ask some questions about this. Have them up. All right. So you subtract, so now go ahead and jot this down. You subtract six from both sides and get 174 on the left. All right, that's nice. And then over here, you have two times whatever the base angle is. And that base angle is what we're trying to nab, all right? All right, so now you've got to divide by 2 on both sides, all right? That's this. And that'll give you the base angle itself. So go ahead and calculate on your calculator 187, or uh, what, excuse me, 174 divided by 2, and you'll get 87 for the base angle. Anybody verify me on that with your calculator? Okay. All right, good. Now you want to follow along with your calculator. You got to have everything ready, okay? Because we're, we're going to go to the next one here, all right? Because this logic applies for any instant of time that I may choose after time t equals zero, okay? So the second example was an even earlier time. Uh, when the wheel has turned 4 degrees. So the time is 0 0.00833 seconds, as you know from the homework. And it's an even more slivery triangle. It's only, you know, the velocities tail to tail form a 4 degree angle, right? It's a little bit earlier. And so the wheel has already only turned 4 degrees. So the velocity vectors, when you put them tail to tail, they form a four degree, really sharp angle, right? And the velocity, the delta V vector, here it is. I'll bring it in from the left, right? There it is. It's even smaller and it's tilted 88 degrees with respect to vector V zero, right? And it's actually tilted 88 uh, degrees with respect to vector uh, V 0 0.00833, right? So the two of them are uh, 88 degrees apart, all right? Now here's the calculation for it. Just reinforce, you know, jot this down and, you know, you, you may think to yourself, boy, Dr. B, I'm really struggling with this stuff. Let's just jot it down, here it is. The three angles have to add up to 180. Okay, that's the left-hand side. And then the three angles are over here on the right side, two base angles, both the same size. So whatever the base angle is, multiply that by two. And then add another four degrees, and that's got to add up to 180. That's the law of triangles, or one of the laws of triangles. You know, from, from the days of the ancient Greeks, they knew this, you know, 180 degrees. All right, so subtract four from both sides. Now you have 176. No problem. Just take that 176, divide by 2. And if you calculate that out on your uh, rig, uh, you will get uh, 88 degrees. Now, I want you to add a note. And it's actually kind of important. 
The delta V vector, as you can see, is a little bit smaller. It's shorter. It's tilted slightly differently, right? It's still tip to tip, but the two vectors, the two isosceles sides, are slightly different. Well, different from the previous example. We have V0 and then V00, 0, 0, 0 0.00833, that's tilted slightly less, all right? But the delta T is the elapsed time between the two snapshots that we're working with here is also smaller. So the ratio of delta V over delta T, in other words, the acceleration, isn't necessarily getting smaller, right? Now, an example of that, you know, of a ratio that's the same, even though the, the numbers top and bottom change, Here's an example, and hopefully this makes sense to you. Uh, 28 over 242. All right, go ahead and jot that one down. Now, another um, pair of numbers, top and bottom, that correspond to that ratio are 14 and 121. 14 over 121, and both of those in decimal fraction uh, notation 0 0.1157, 0 0.2479338843, blah de blah. You know, it's a it's it's a fraction that just keeps going. It's not a um, it's a rational number, but it's not a uh, it's it's not a terminal decimal. Anyway, they're they're both equal to that. So th that's what we've got here with our delta V's and our delta T's. The delta T's are getting smaller, and so are the delta V's. So the acceleration might be the same the whole way, right? And that's good because we should expect that if it's on uniform circular motion with a centripetal acceleration, um, the speed's not changing, all right? And so the acceleration... Uh, only the, the only thing that's changing is the direction, but it's the same circle, it's the same speed, so this ratio, delta V over delta T, the acceleration, ought to be the same number any time I take a snapshot. All right, now, let's take another snapshot. Okay. After the wheel, and this is the third instance uh, from the homework. After the wheel turns two degrees, now delta V is 89 degrees from vector V0, all right? Because 180 minus 2 is 179, or 178. 178 divided by 2 is 89, all right? So let's go through the picture sequence. You know, we're just going to keep going through here, all right? So here's the picture sequence. Now look at this. Don't make notes. Just look, because you already got these sketches, hopefully. Here's the first one, all right, six degrees, all right, 87 degrees for the base angle, four degrees, 88 degrees for the base angle, two degrees, which we just did, 89 degrees for the base angle. Next one, one degree. 89.5 degrees for the base angle, right? Because that one is 179 divided by 2. Check it out on your calculator, 179 divided by 2. 89.5, right? And notice how those two, now this is an even earlier time, all right? And so the... So it's like taking two snapshots really close together in time. And you get a really narrow, and this is the last image that I made for you of the velocity arrows. They're basically on top of each other. You could probably do it if you had a really big piece of paper, graph paper and stuff. But this is the last one that I attempted to do, all right, at uh, one degree. And then I said, uh, after the wheel turns a very small angle, um, 
I asked you to calculate. And you can always calculate. If you know the tilt of, or the rotation of the wheel, you know, 0 0.72 degrees or, or whatever it happens to be, you can calculate the, the tilt of the delta V, right? And it gets ever closer to a perfect 90 degrees. Here's the example that we did in homework five. All right, this is question number 10. All right, now we're gonna do this on eye clippers in a second. So let me pause for questions about anything that we did here. Go ahead. The same thing, the same way we just did six degrees, four degrees, two degrees, one degrees. Subtract the angle from 180 and then divide by two. All right. We, we just did that, you know, with six degrees it worked. That's how you got it for six. That's how you got it for four. That's how you got it for two. And then one, and then homework to, you know, and we're going to do this one, see if you can do it for a decimal less than one. Another question. Multiple choice, we're, we haven't opened it yet, just hold on. Yeah, it's going to be a, a calculation, so get ready to. All right, no more questions. Let's go. Let's try it. Let's try it on iClicker. All right, and it's numeric. Here it is. At a very early time, you know, our 80 RPM wheel has moved. There's your angle, 0 0.16 degrees. Now just do the same thing with 0 0.16 that we did with 6 degrees, 4 degrees, 2 degrees, and 1 degree. Same philosophy, it's just a little bit smaller. Okay, so type in the number um, on your, and uh, can you put the lights up? Because the, the decimal uh, point in your eye clicker is really small. Okay, so what do you think? Feeling better? Good. Good. The decimal point is really hard to see. I, I think it's like, two clicks below the zero, if I remember correctly. All right, so type in here, oh my goodness. Now round it off to the nearest 0, 0.0. So I want two decimal points in your answer. So something, point, something, something. Question? Okay. Did you find your notes? Okay, good. That's good. I didn't mean to put you on the spot earlier. I just... I always like looking at students' notebooks and stuff as I go down the aisle, so. All right, 20 seconds. Almost done here. Let's keep an eye on how many we got here. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ching. All right. Uh, raise your hand if you had this answer. Yes, excellent. Uh, Darren, go ahead and show them. You know what this tells me? 
See that? 89%. And a couple people typed in 89.9. They didn't round off right. That's why, because I can see this while you guys are clicking. And so I, I warned you, but you, you didn't change your answer back. Anyways, good job. You guys are geniuses today. I'm very happy about that. All right. Now, let's go to a new topic. Actually, it's not new. It's the concept of momentum. But now we're going to get down into the nitty gritty and really talk about momentum as the coin of Sir Isaac Newton's realm. The coin of the interaction realm. Momentum. Now, here's an image from homework four, the skateboard problem. And it was, you know, it was something that we talked about in class. It's something that we talked about in lecture. I mean, we had a demonstration in class, and we talked about it in lecture. Uh, actually, before exam one. Um, and this is the part here um, that I want to ask you about. Um, how much momentum P does Gregory capture from the interaction? This is really a cinchy problem. Because in Sir Isaac Newton's third law, if you encode it as an um, exchange of momentum, whatever Raymond gets, Gregory gets just the opposite direction. Right? So if you can figure out Raymond's momentum, okay, and he travels 1.05 meters in a, in a time of 0 0.52 seconds, so you can figure out his, his V, his average speed, and then multiply that by 75 kilograms, that is his momentum. And so Gregory gets the same amount. Now, who's going to the right? Uh, I can't, let me go back here. Okay, so Raymond is going to the left, and Gregory in green, this is Gregory over here, uh, with the green wheels, he's going to the right, uh, so he has a positive value for the momentum. So Gregory's got, you know, like negative something, point something, something. And so, uh, or excuse me, Raymond's got negative something, point something, something, momentum. Ma matter of fact, let's calculate that. What's uh, 1.05 divided by 0 0.52? It's going to be about 2.0 something. Two point zero. Anybody verify that? Two point zero two. Okay. Multiply. So multiply by seventy five. So that's going to be about one fifty something. One fifty one. And for Raymond, it's negatory. So Gregory gets positive one fifty one kilogram meters per second. All right. Now. Last time we were talking about the interaction of the moon and the earth, Newton's theory of universal gravitation. That gravitational interaction can also be styled or thought of as an exchange of momentum. Except there, it's not one big blob of momentum and then nothing else happens with the, as the skateboarder, as happens with the skateboarders. With the moon and the earth, they're continually exchanging momentum, right? It's, in other words, there's a force, a force acting over time. It's, you know, it, the gravitational force doesn't go away. But you can think of it, you know, as every second of the moon orbiting the earth, um, that the earth delivers so many kilogram meters per second of momentum to the moon. That's basically a force. So let's take a look at this impulse uh, equation again. And when we come out the other side, we're going to uh, be in a position where we can really start to attack the space-time symmetry of Sir Isaac Newton's three laws of motion. And then we're going to get into some really cool stuff. All right, so... The impulse is F delta T. Sometimes you see it written F times T, you know, in a 
various textbooks. Here's a vector version of it up here with the F uh, with a little arrow over the top indicating, you know, you, you really can, if you want, if you need to, think in three dimensions. Uh, delta P, P is a little arrow over the top of it. Uh, so you can think of it, if necessary, in three dimensions. And that impulse, F delta T, is equal to the change in the momentum state uh, for the object. So change of momentum is equal to the impulse. And this is another form, actually, of F equals MA. And a couple weeks ago, I showed you that German postage stamp. Matter of fact, I believe that was the last thing I showed you before exam one. Right, so this is actually tracing our way all the way back to exam one. Now, I want to do some calculations with you, all right? And what we're going to do is talk about the stopping time problem and how the impulse formula can help you uh, do one of two standard calculations. Stopping time, stopping distance. This is going to help with stopping time, all right? So, for instance, if you're uh, designing a car um, and you want to calculate the stopping distance, you need to um, figure out the momentum state of the car or its kinetic energy and then calculate the force that will stop you in a certain distance. All right? if, you wanna, if you're designing a machine and you want a part of your machine to stop in a certain time, you know, like 0.01 seconds, then, you know, you measure the momentum state of the part that you want to stop, and then the stopping time, and you figure out the force. So you apply a force with a spring or, you know, some other way of delivering a force to, you know, part of your machine. All right, so two classic problems to solve, stopping time and stopping distance. Let's do stopping time. Here's an example. Uh, and this is... If you look at it carefully, you'll see, oh, that's from a homework. It's from a homework you haven't had yet. Uh, given a coin of mass 0 0.05 kilograms, uh, sliding across a tabletop from left to right. At initial point x1, its speed is, let me go over here, the same picture. Um, at x1, its speed is 1.7 meters per second. All right, so we have the initial momentum. 0.05 kilograms times 1.7, that's the initial speed. Okay, it's going rightward. And then we have a frictional force. Now the frictional force in this problem, 0 0.020 newtons, and it's going leftward. So the only way to stop something that's moving to the right is to use a force that's pointing to the left. That'll slow it down. All right, and friction will always... Friction stops working when you stop moving, right? So, uh, so friction is, is a nice one to do. So it slows down to a stop at position X2. What is the stopping time for this coin? Now, we could figure out the stopping distance from this, too, if we wanted to. But let's figure out the stopping time. All right, so delta T. So um, we want to figure out P1 and P2. So that's MV at initial point and MV again at the final point. And that'll allow us to calculate delta P. Because what we want to do is F delta T equals delta P. Right? So putting it together, we don't need to put together F. We know what F is. It's 0 0.020 newtons. Right? So that's squared away. But we do have to figure out delta P. And we've got the parts up here to, to do so. Let me ask you a question. Without even hitting your calculator, what is the value of P2 after it comes to a stop? What is it? Goose egg. Somebody in the back said, they didn't even say anything. They just went like this. Goose egg. It stopped. So P2 is the cinchy one. All right? But P1 we still have to calculate. All right? And we got the force for the impulse side of the equation, 0 0.020 newtons left. And hey, you guys, we're going to put in some minus signs here to denote leftward. 
right? This is a, a one-dimensional problem, but we're working with vectors, um, so, but it's, it's fairly good, fairly easy. We use a minus sign to denote leftward, all right? So leftward momentum or leftward force. Right, and so this one's going to show. So this one, when we write it in the equation, in the impulse equation, f delta t equals delta p, uh, we're going to write it in as a negative 0 0.020 newtons. All right, and that'll that'll handle our directionality. Now, if you're working in three dimensions like these guys in hidden figures, you know you got to do a little bit. You got to do a lot of trig and stuff like that. But for us in one dimension, this will be a good workout and minus signs will tell the tale. All right, so let's set it up. So here's our example, all right? And you'll probably have something like this on homework because I know you get sad and lonely if you don't have any homework. So I'll try to get some setup for you tonight. All right, first one, P1, the mass 0 0.05, initial speed, 1.7 meters per second, D initial direction, rightward. Okay, so this is positive, right? So it's a vector quantity, and I'm representing the direction with that positive sign. Although I don't always do that. You know, I, I'll write a minus sign in if I need it, but I don't always put a positive sign. But for here, you know, it's good. Right? So I've, my initial starting momentum say is positive it's right whoops you know it starts out moving sliding across the table in this direction right so that works out to be 0 0.085 kilogram meters per second right now there's no fancy word uh, or fancy title for that unit the unit of, of momentum is just kilogram meters per second you know the unit of force as a name, Newton, one kilogram meter per second squared. Uh, but we don't have a fancy one for momentum until you get to the realm of uh, atoms and nuclei and stuff. All right, now P2, particularly easy, goose egg time. Okay, zero kilogram meters per second. All right, now those two right there allow you now to calculate delta P. Now, you know, delta P, delta anything, is a subtraction, a difference. D for delta, D for difference. But what gets subtracted from what? This one's going to be something minus something. It's going to be P2 minus P1. So let's set that up. Here we go. All right, delta P. All right, here's P2. That's good old Mr. Goose Egg. And then, all right, here's P1, but I'm, this minus sign is not a directional minus sign. It's a delta operator, a minus sign to subtract, right? But it becomes down here, now my delta P vector has a direction. It's leftward. All right, now the physical interpretation of this is I'm losing rightward momentum. My momentum change is negative. So my momentum changes to the left. So if I have rightward, I lose it. I lose some of it every second, all right? So every second, that I'm being uh, under the force of friction, I'm losing uh, some, uh, some rightward momentum, and that's signified by the minus sign. All right, now let's put together the impulse formula. F delta T equals delta P, and this is a vector version. It's got the little arrows over the top. And now, we have negative signs on the left for the friction force, and we've already talked about that negative sign. And now we got one over here. Nice. And now there's our, you know, there's our, now what we gotta do is solve for delta T. 
But there's something really nice about this. Uh, anybody see anything nice about the equation here as it stands? <coughs> yep, you can cancel out the negative sign now if you want. Now, I'm going to keep the negative sign. But yeah, these two babies, yeah, you can cancel them out if you want. All right, now I'm going to keep them around for a little bit longer to show you another place where you can cancel. You know, you might not think, you know, you're doing this in the middle of a test. You're working over in the margin or in the little area, and you're trying to get it right, and you got a minus sign. You don't think about it, but maybe you'll think about it at the next step. All right, so here's, a, here's the last two lines. Impulse equation and negative zero, and then the actual number. So here's the impulse equation up here. That's my model or my, my law, basically Newton's second law, in momentum interaction terminology. And then here's my plugins. And one of them was given the friction force, but then one of them on the right, we, the delta P, we had to calculate that, but it wasn't too grievous. And hey, you guys, anytime you have a stopping time or a stopping distance, you're going to have a goose egg somewhere. All right? and for us, it was P2. That was our goose egg because right? it came to a stop. All right, let's keep going. Now, to clear that and get delta T by itself, um, I'm going to divide both sides by negative 0 0.020 newtons. All right. And so this goes back to high school algebra class. And so here's what, it, you know, it clears delta T. Delta T is by itself now on the left. And my numerator is still negative 0 0.085 kilogram meters per second. But now my denominator is negative 0 0.020 uh, newtons. And notice, you guys, that instead of writing the word newtons, you know, like up here in this line right above it, when I b divide both sides by 0 0.020, I have it as newtons. But now over here, I've converted the notation. Instead of a capital N, I have kilogram meters per second squared. And that's perfectly fine. That's what newton means in kilograms, meters, and seconds. Right now, the reason that we're doing that is because we want to do some cancelization. All right? Kilogram meters cancel top and bottom. Second squared is the denominator in the denominator, so it flips into the numerator. So you have second squared divided by seconds in the numerator, and so that reduces down to seconds. Also, the minus signs, you could cancel them here if you wanted to. If you didn't cancel them earlier, you can cancel them here, no problem. Or as they say in the NBA, no sweat. All right? Nothing but net. All right? So then you calculate it, and uh, you get 4.25. And if you were going to, you know, you might want to round that off to, you know, a single, depending on what I ask you. You know, for the answer, I might tell you, give me to the nearest 0 0.01, or I might say, give me to the nearest 0 0.1 uh, seconds, nearest tenth of a second. So if I do that, then it would be 4.3. All right. Now, we're going to do some calculations here. All right. So get your clickers ready. And let me just check. Hit your refresh key because this next one is multiple choice. All right, so hit refresh. Okay, and that'll change your clicker back into just hit the A, B, C, D, or E. All right, here's your question. Now, this one's an impulse uh, formula question, and talk, with your, talk it over with your neighbor. Consult blob of green jello floating in space. Klingon bird of prey, tractor beam. I wish I knew how to make a tractor beam. You know, if I had a tractor beam, 
you, I could hijack all the, think of all the donuts you could hijack with a tractor beam. All right, so 12 newtons, force. All right, so this is basically, you know, impulse calculations. So this, we haven't gotten the stopping time yet. All right. This is just saying, all right, what if you have two seconds of tractor beam? How much does that deliver? And just give me a, a you know, it's going to be, I, I've listed everything here, all your options as positive numbers. So. I was watching one of the old Star Treks on TV the other day, and they, and they always had the weirdest planets. You know, like the, some guy that was like Shakespeare on this strange planet from another universe and stuff. Why does that always, you know, did you ever notice that? Or some planet where Spock falls in love, you know, and Kirk turns into an evil guy, and Spock turns into his opposite. He falls in love with some lady. That's weird. So yeah, outer space. How are we doing here? Okay, 30 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Unmark that one. Mark it later. Go ahead and display this. Okay, here's our distribution of answers. Now, this means we got to talk it over a little bit. All right, we've, hold on. We've got 35, we've got 75% of U's split into A and D, and then a sprinkling in the other uh, five choices. So we got a little bit of a controversy here between A and D. All right, let's go back to the regular display. And let's take a look at A and D. Okay, A is 24 kilogram meters per second. D is 9.0 kilogram meters per second. Now those are both impulses. You know, it has units of kilogram meters per second. Matter of fact, everything has units of kilogram meters per second. All right? Now, 9.0, that is not the impulse from the tractor beam. This is the impulse. And here's how you can know that. The impulse is the force times the interaction time. So 12 newtons times 2 seconds. 9 kilogram, nine kilogram meters per second is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, an accurate number, but not for the impulse from the tractor beam. What is that equal to? What is it? It's the momentum at the outset. It's the initial momentum. Now, if you're trying to figure out the final momentum state, then yeah, you would want to use that, but that's a little bit bigger calculation. All I was asking you, basically here, go ahead and make a note. 
I was asking you, compute F delta T. All right? I didn't say anything about stopping. Matter of fact, let me ask you, use your coconut. You know, that round object at the top of your neck. Think. The initial momentum state is 9 kilogram meters per second for this blob of green jello. The tractor beam in two seconds delivers 24 kilogram meters per second, and we're going to assume it's in the opposite direction. Right? Because, you know, the Klingons want it. And they're, tr they're trying to attract it and bring it into the, you know, to their vessel so they can have some dessert, I guess. Right? So, question. I want you to think. Is 24 kilogram meters per second of momentum toward the Klingon bird of prey vessel, as the detractor beam must do, is that enough to stop it? Or something else? What will happen? What do you think will happen? Those two numbers are not the same. Think. What do you think? Yeah, do you have an idea? Yeah. In the back, what do you think? It'll yeah, it'll start. It won't just stop it. That will just, you know, what will that take? 12, it'll take three quarters of a second to stop it. But then after that, if you go another 1.25 seconds, it's going to start coming back towards the Klingon bird of prey vessel. Of their warship. All right, so they're going to capture that, which is what tractor beams are supposed to do. So the final, the fi you know, when we have a stopping time problem, you know, P2 is going to be equal to zero. But this ain't, I didn't ask you a stopping time, and this interaction time, two seconds, is more than enough to stop it. You, you halt its forward progress, and then, whoop, starts coming back. You know, so you're, you, you know, that jello's, you know, booking all out of the way of that Klingon, you know, but all of a sudden it's, whoa, I'm moving backwards, you know. So the jello has been captured or will be captured. Next question. Multiple choice. All right. All right, basketball. Actually, this, this should be. Use this for, this is a, a little heavy for a basketball. I, lead, I found out. Retarding force, stopping force of 11 newtons, 0.8. Now this is a stopping time question. So this one's the full, the full Mahoney. What's the stopping time? So now you use the entire formula and you want to find out delta T. I haven't given you delta T. You got to figure which one will stop and just bring it to a stop. So make sure you consult with your neighbor. Double check your figures and stuff. And if you disagree with your neighbor or your neighbor disagrees with you, try to settle your differences. And if you're over there by the wall and you don't have a neighbor to try to, to talk to, try to...
guess what else happened today? I forgot my lunch. I'm sorry. I'm telling you. I fixed up my lunch last night. You know, you know a little container? Meatloaf? Nice. I forgot it. So I'm starving right now. I tell you the sacrifices that must be made for the progress of science. Okay, 20 seconds to vote. Starting now. Ten seconds, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh, raise your hand if you voted for 1.6, option D. Geniuses. 89% uh, of you got that one, nice. Uh, wait a minute, let me see those hands again if you voted for 1.6. Nice. Nice. And if you didn't, here's the calculation. So go ahead and take a look. Maybe jot this down for extra reinforcement. Uh, we're doing an F delta T equals delta P uh, calculation. And... Um, Ooh, this should be 0 0.800 0 times 22. That looks 80 times 0. Anyway, 17.6 is your initial momentum state. And so that goes in on the right side. And we're not doing any minus signs here because it's pretty easy to do. Uh, we did minus signs on the other problem, but this one we're just doing positives everywhere because we know they cancel out. Uh, so there's your, so we know 11 newtons. And if we were doing minus signs, it would be minus 11 newtons and then minus 17.6. But I didn't really give you any directions and stuff. This is going to do the job. All right, so now you get the 11 newtons over to the right side. You divide both sides by 11 newtons. And just as before, when you def divide a kilogram meter per second of momentum by a newton, you get seconds for the, um, for the answer. So that works out to 1.6. Right, so there's your answer. Right. So you're doing good. Uh, you did really well on that. 89% of you got it correct. I'm very happy about that. Now, I want to show you some strobe photos. Another thing about this, what we're going to do now is think about a sequence of snapshots, and we're going to use a falling basketball, but we're going to think about the, the motion of the basketball in straight free fall uh, like we would think of strobe photos. So here's, here's another one. Strobe photo of a drop of water dripping out of the faucet. It's kind of cool looking, actually. All right, so we're going to think stroboscopically. Uh, and this is the, the true mass of a basketball. It's actually 0 0.62 kilograms. All right, so what we're going to do is take a vertical path. And we're going to divide it up by equal increments of time. So my strobe is, is flashing every 0 0.25 seconds. All right. So I start, you know, I take a, a shot at time t equals 0, and then t equals 0 0.25 seconds. It's a falling a little bit further. And then the next strobe flash goes off at t equals 0 0.50. And it's a little bit further again. And you know, it's going faster as it goes down. So every 0.25 uh, seconds gets you a little bit further down range because you're, you're speeding up, right? So um, 
Now, the thing I want to make, um, did you read my gravitation chapter? Chapter G, mini chapter G. Raise your hand if you downloaded it. Oh. <laughs> Good. All right. You better download it because the homework's going to be loaded with questions from it. I want you to read it. What's that? It's on uh, additional chapters, I think, the additional chapters page. It's linked to the home page. Okay, so go there and you download it. Did you know that the amount of time it takes... Remember the first day of class we had that pendulum? And it was a certain length and it swang or swung. It swung at a certain rate, certain frequency, certain amount of time for each swing. Did you know that the amount of time to fall that same distance is equal to half the time of the swing? So if you, you uh, equal increments of delta P. Anyway, so for this one, every 0.25 seconds, you get um, an additional 1.52 kilogram meter per second of momentum downward. All right. And the way that you figure that out is um, delta V is equal to G delta T. So you can write that equation down if you want. Delta V is, you know, in free fall is G delta T. Okay, so this one's dropped from rest at time T equals zero. So in a quarter of a second, it gains 9.8 times 0 0.25 seconds of speed. So 9.8 times 0.25 is, uh, what is that? 9.8 times two, 0 0.25. That should be about 2 points. Two point, anybody verify 2.45? Yeah. Okay. So, two point, so you're, you're getting 2.45 meters per second every quarter of a second a free fall, all right? And multiply that uh, by the mass 0 0.62, and it works out to 1.52 approximately, all right? So the, the kicker here is that the change in the position is not equal increments. So this is a vertical trajectory. And if we do our bookkeeping according to time, the fourth dimension, we get equal increments of delta P. You know, another 1.52 every quarter of a second. And we don't get equal increments of delta Y though. We, keep, we get more, delta Y gets bigger and bigger. But delta P is always 1.52. 1.52, 1.52 for every quarter second to drop. Right now, that's significant. Horizontally, there's no horizontal force. It's free fall. No such thing as horizontal gravity. So the only change in the momentum here in this simple example is, uh, is vertical. So there's no uh, horizontal delta P. So the only delta P is from gravity downward. Now on Thursday, we're gonna work out the implications of this and we're gonna start talking about kinetic energy. So I want you to read mini chapter G Chapter 4, start reading all the way through that. And I'm going to give you some boxcar questions in homework, hopefully by dinner time tonight. And it, just a few, and it will be due on Thursday. All right? You're dismissed, and I'll see you Thursday.
dismissed them early today.